What made you decide that Ryan was the one to tell your story? Okay. Uh, first of all, when Rafi Marmor, the producer, called me and said he wants to do a documentary, I said, no, thank you. I had just done something for the BBC in England. I said, enough already. I don't have time. That's what I really said. And then he kept on talking a little, and he told me that he did a movie called, um, called No Place on Earth. And that sentence, of course, resonated with me because that's my background. I said, let me see that movie. I saw the movie. It's about a group of Jews in Ukraine that uh, survived uh, by the local population feeding them for over a year underground. And then he sa I said, OK, come to New York. We'll talk. Then he said he wants to work with Ryan White. I said, get me his films. Ryan owes me seven and a half hours of my life <laughs> because I watched the whole series of his films on uh, Netflix. And uh, like a cliffhanger, I couldn't stop watching because every time <laughs> one finished, I had to watch the next about the uh, nun, the beautiful nun who was killed in uh, Baltimore. So I said, get to New York, we'll talk. And then once I decided, after I've seen all of his other films, uh, I, then, I, uh, then I knew that I'm going to work hard. But Ryan worked even harder than me. Uh, his crew, David, the photographer, was fantastic. And uh, we took Ryan to Israel. And uh, it was interesting because Ryan is not Jewish. And it gave a different perspective to my uh, story. But we went to Israel, and I made him um, jump in the Kinneret naked, where Jesus <laughs> went down. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. She made me bring my wet underwear back to her. I, to I got prove it. that I, I had been in the, the Sea of Galilee, right? Not only the Sea of Galilee, but I had... Um, he had to prove that he really uh, did go at the steps of, of uh, uh, Jesus. So um, it was a very interesting, it was very hard work. They worked very hard, and I worked hard too. And it was interesting uh, to get a different perspective of uh, somebody who has done so many documentaries. There's also a real palpable warmth and chemistry, I think, watching the film that it seems like you developed as a team when you were working together but, on this. But I love him much better now without the camera because <laughs> I was so careful of every word that I was saying <laughs> because that guy had constantly, not only the photographer, David, but you also have a camera. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was very happy after my uh, birthday party to go uh, to talk to him alone without a camera. <laughs> One of the things that you are very clear on in the film is that you don't like to talk about politics, or you felt that it was not appropriate to talk about politics given that the work that you do otherwise. Okay. But my understanding is that that's changed recently, and you do feel okay. like now you So these, uh, uh, since some things change in life, even for a 91-year-old, <laughs> I have always said I don't talk about politics. Then somebody who talks about sex from morning till night has to stay away from politics. These days, I have changed my mind. I'm very upset when I see children being separated from their parents, because that's my story. And I'm very upset about the issue of that we have to worry again about uh, legalized abortion and about funding for uh, family planning. So I have changed my mind. <laughs> and I certainly know, look at this wonderful audience here, and the applause again, uh, that you are with me. I like that. <laughs> Well, I've, one of the things that I found fascinating in watching the film was seeing how you began your career, in fact, working at Planned Parenthood. What do you feel like you learned from that experience, from that time? Well, the first thing I learned is that 
uh, we have to make sure that people can have control over their own lives. And that's something that I did not have at the age of 10 and a half. I had no choice but to be sent, otherwise I wouldn't be alive. So the uh, uh, issue of uh, my fortunately getting a position with Planned Parenthood of New York City in research was really crucial in the developing, in my professional development. Not only did I use the data for my doctoral dissertation, but I also uh, became so much more um, interested in people having control over their own lives. That's why I'm uh, talking that we have to support uh, these organizations. Well, and you mentioned also that the part of your story from your childhood, being separated from your parents as a child during the Holocaust, has also informed your political engagement now. What was it like to revisit those difficult years when you were working on the film? Well, the one thing that I had told uh, Ryan, and he found the clip, I don't know how you find all of those, but um, what I did not like uh, when I went, started to go on lectures, the citizen arrest, which is a, a true story, I did not like that, because that reminded me of the background of Nazi Germany. There was, uh, this fellow was a, a politician who liked to be on television, so they had told me that there is somebody in the front row who is going to interrupt. I wanted to know if he has a gun, because as you see from my experience, I know what guns uh, can do. They said no. And then I have to tell you a funny story, which I don't know if Ryan knows. <laughs> oh, boy. So watch great. if he blushes. <laughs> watch. The, uh, after that citizen arrest, um, they, they took him away, and the a uh, state trooper took me to the motel, and then the next morning, somebody was supposed to take me to the airport. And the very good-looking state trooper, <laughs> and he, he took me to the motel, and he said, because I was a little bit upset, he said, do you want me to, the, the motel had two rooms, a bedroom upstairs and a bedroom downstairs. He said, do you want me to stay overnight? I said, sure. <laughs> I called his wife, and I told him there are two bedrooms here. Right after he drops me at the airport, he's going to go home, and you are going to have good sex for the rest of your life. <laughs> so he really took me uh, home. So when they told me ahead of time uh, that uh, there will be somebody to, to make a citizen of I... There was no, I, I had no choice. It was on a college campus. I couldn't say, no, don't permit that guy to be there. Uh, so as it turned out, um, it makes an important point of that you have to stand up and be counted. Well, I'm tempted to just figure out ways to get you telling more and more stories. <laughs> but do you have any particular moments that didn't make it into the film that you were sorry to see on the cutting room floor? This is a question for both of you, Ryan and Ruth. Were there stories that didn't make it into the film? Of course. Would like They're not going to make it here tonight either. <laughs> <laughs> I have plenty. We could do, we could do another three documentaries. <laughs> they are staying with me. But I have to say that, um, uh, Ryan, besides working very hard, you, you really are a very talented and very, very thoughtful uh, filmmaker, mm -hmm. and you also manage to make an atmosphere for the crew, for your director and for the other people who work, the sound person, that was very, uh, very good to work with. Mm -hmm. So now we are friends. Once he puts that camera away, now I can be friends. I was not a friend of his, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was watching him like, like uh, a hawk <laughs> of every moment of what he's going to ask me. And some of the questions, when I said, next question, that's, it, it made it into the film. It was very good. <laughs> so I want to say something else. Uh, I was very worried when I heard about animation. I understood that you didn't have enough material from my childhood, from after the age of 10 and a half, to show what happened to me later. I understood that. I was very worried. I thought, 
you live in Los Angeles, you're going to make me look like Pinocchio <laughs> or, <laughs> or like uh, Mickey Mouse. As it turns out, the people you hired, that you found and your team found, were brilliant because there are two Israelis, a man and a woman, and brilliant, doc, uh, brilliant animation makers because at the railroad station in Frankfurt on that day of January 5th, 1939, a few months before the outbreak of World War II, at that train uh, station, that wasn't just my mother and grandmother saying goodbye. There were all of the other mothers and grandmothers uh, the, the, all of the men had been taken to labor camp, who also came to say goodbye to the other children. What they did under your direction was brilliant because I talk a lot about loneliness. And here is a plug for my forthcoming uh, Sex for Dummies uh, in another month <laughs> and a half, where I talk about millennials and about my concern about loneliness uh, because they're all hooked to their telephone, and the art of conversation going to be lost. And that gives me a way, not only that, that color that they used is like a little bit like an orange, and it really kind of physically implies loneliness. So you found brilliant people. The music is wonderful. Now tell them the story about that the guy almost missed. Oh. You tell them. <laughs> you, you don't know that story. I don't know the story. So I can't wait. <laughs> uh, a, a good friend of mine is a film composer, and uh, 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 he's in the band Childish Gambino with Donald Glover. So he, he just won the Oscar for Black Panther composing yeah. that. He also just won two Grammys for uh, Album of the Year and Record of the Year. And Dr. Ruth was going to the Grammys this year. Uh, and he is married to the violinist who plays the score on wow. Ask Dr. Ruth. Serena McKinney. So she's an amazing violinist, and she said, I really want to meet Dr. Ruth. So I set them up over text at the Grammys, and at some point, Serena dragged her husband back to meet Dr. Ruth. Not dragged, he wanted to meet you. Yes. <laughs> as, there, as you can tell, Dr. Ruth can talk. <laughs> so as he's talking to her, you know, where, they were in the front row, they went back to meet Dr. Ruth in whatever row she was in. He won Song of the Year. <laughs> And he but missed. Doc, Dr. Ruth was chatting away. Right. <laughs> and he didn't feel comfortable. They did, the award was announced earlier than they thought it was going to be. He didn't feel comfortable saying, to interrupting Why? the conversation. So That's he lucky. missed accepting the award. It was a big deal. Look it up. Wow. It was all over the news. Like nobody from Childish Gambino went on stage to accept Song of the Year. Ex except that then he won the other then award. Then he won Album of the Year, the yeah, last then... award of the night, and he got to go up and, and yeah. give an acceptance <laughs> speech. And she thought it was the funniest thing in the world that he, she, she, made, I, she had me record an apology video to him I did, I did. that he loves. Can we find that? <laughs> he has it privately. I didn't so. think, oh, go ahead. I didn't think there was going to be a Venn diagram overlap between Childish Gambino and Dr. Ruth. <laughs> you found it. I mean, let's be clear. Dr. Ruth has no idea who Childish Gambino is. But still. <laughs> no idea. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm very, I'm very pleased. We'll do a plug for um, uh, uh, no, no, not Netflix, but Hulu. Hulu. Yeah, I, want, <laughs> I want to do a plug for Hulu. Luckily, Hulu isn't here right now <laughs> to, have, to have seen that. You know, you know why I, I had some trouble thinking of Hulu because for a while they didn't let me say it. Yeah until June 1st. Yeah. So now, all of you say loud and clear Hulu? <laughs> okay. And I'm very interested that the film should go to universities and uh, to high schools even, uh, because it will, it will give an opportunity to teach some lessons. For example, in 1939, some of you people here know about this, 1938, um, there was a conference in Evian, and the conference was called to save German Jewry. And Roosevelt sent an emissary, and uh, other free countries sent emissaries, and the conference failed miserably. Mm -hmm. 
nothing happened out of that except the cry, let's at least save the children. So England, despite the dark clouds on the horizon of pre-war, they knew that there would be a war. Uh, England took 10,000 Jewish children. Holland, Belgium, France, and Switzerland took 300 each. And for some reason, I was on that group to Switzerland. Otherwise, I would not be alive. The children in England all survived. And the children in um, Holland, Belgium, and France uh, did not. So um, that's another way of being able to teach about the rise of uh, Nazism. And right now, another plug, um, Jeff Tabak over there, who is on the board of the Museum of Jewish Heritage with me. And where is uh, Patty's daughter? Where are you? Right there. Her mother is a very active member of the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And all of you, please, if you get to New York, please come and visit. We have an, an exhibit on Auschwitz. Uh, and it's called Auschwitz. Not long ago, not far from here, that people have to see twice. First time, you're going to be very upset because there's also the freight car that the Nazis used to transport people like my parents. And uh, there is an exhibit. You have to go twice. First, you're going to be very upset. Second time, you're going to learn something about the rise of Nazism in, uh, in, in Germany that um, they did a super, super job in that exhibit that's coming from Madrid. So all of this I can now kind of link because of your film uh, of saying of the importance of standing up and to be counted. Well, speaking of... I want to make sure we have a lot of time for audience questions because I think mm -hmm. it's an enthusiastic crowd and there will be lots of questions. But as a final one from me, um, You've been a teacher for many, 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 many years. What are you learning from your students these days? And what's changed in the years that you've been teaching? What I've learned? Yeah. OK, so um, in the Talmud, in the Jewish tradition, it says that any teacher, many teachers here, and you learn from your students. So every, that's why I'm keeping teaching. Because I every week, that I teach at Columbia and now also at Hunter, I learn something new from students. So I would suggest that everybody who is engaged in the helping profession to also try to teach. Yeah. Take some. <laughs> well, let's get some audience questions. We'll have mics coming around. You, right there in the... This, yeah. one, this film was incredible. It was incredible, and my question is, will it not be in theaters to the general public? It, it just was in theaters, actually. So it we just had... So it has been. It aware. just was in theaters in May. Um, for a, a, a limited theatrical release, because documentaries don't get that huge of a release, but it was in over 100 theaters uh, across the country, which is pretty big for a documentary. And then it went up on Hulu on June 1st. So. Um, anybody with Hulu can watch it. Anybody without Hulu can get a free one, since Hulu isn't here again, <laughs> a free one month subscription. So tell people they can watch it, it was, for a month and cancel if they don't want the rest of Hulu. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's available now across the board. Okay, it was absolutely outstanding. Thank you. Outstanding. <clears throat> Dr. Ruth, you are such an inspiration to all of us to really live life we need to think about that more. We get too caught up in junk. And you're a wonderful inspiration. Thank you. Agreed. <laughs> now, I have to tell you that Ryan doesn't permit me that I want to have a nomination for an Academy Award. <laughs> he doesn't permit me to talk about it, so you haven't heard it. You just talked about it, so. <laughs> no more, though. <laughs> I think we've got one over there. Oh, 
I'd love to hear more about the idea you shared at the launch of um, Aspen Ideas Help um, around pornography. Could you speak a bit more about that? Would you be able about to? Pornography. About pornography? Yeah. yeah. Um, That's a big idea. <laughs> I just lost the debate. And not, not only me, my, my group lost the debate about pornography at the uh, Oxford Union debate. I did the Oxford Union debate many years ago, and I won. That was on abortion, which you saw. And this one we lost because with the group uh, against my group was a beautiful porn star. <laughs> she was brilliant, and she was a porn star. When I met her, I knew we are not going to win. <laughs> were, you, were you arguing for or against pornography? No, I want pornography. First of all, I want to bury. Loud and clear, we said it two days ago. Jeff, my uh, minister, how did I call you? Secretary of State. Secretary of State. I said, since you made me be the queen of sexually literate uh, matters, I brought my uh, Secretary of State to read the points. So I was for pornography. We have to bury the word pornography, like we buried, uh, now we're calling sex prostitutes sex workers. We have to bury that name, and it has to be available because it helps people to be sexually aroused. But the bedroom door has to be locked, not for children. So in any case, we, we lost, and by landslide, she, we, we had 70 people voting for us, and the others had like 130. And that was because of that porn star. <laughs> <laughs> we have another one in the crowd now. Over here. Hi. I'm really nervous, sorry, and this is really loud. <laughs> um, I'm part of the millennial group that is having trouble finding a significant other. Um, you know, we have lots of options with online dating and um, Tinder and Bumble and all sorts of other things that are available to us, but um, I have just had no luck. I mean, for, for years, years and years and years, pretty much always of, you know, having difficulty finding a significant other. And I do think it has to do with um, my generation, um, a little bit older than me as well. Um, it seems like everybody is on their own personal adventure and they don't have time for connections and relationships. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you could give one small piece of advice for my group. Uh, what would that be on finding love, finding connection? the questions about millennials and the use of technology and how that might adversely affect people finding a connection. I'm all for uh, you people using it and uh, because I'm so concerned about the people being lonely, not just the millennials, that's the, um, the emphasis, but in, in general, but you have to be smart about it because people can lie. They can say they're six feet tall when they are four foot seven. <laughs> and, and you have to be smart of never, ever meeting somebody in a secluded place, but to meet in a lobby of a hotel, in a public place. Uh, but I'm all for people using it because I'm very concerned about that issue of loneliness. So the next documentary, which um, maybe, maybe you have to do one on loneliness, and I'll be a consultant. <laughs> 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 you would not have trouble, I think, finding lonely millennials to appear in that documentary. Um, who else do we have? Oh, in the back, yes. Right up there, raising your hand tall. Yes, I see you, I see you. The mic is coming. It's very really hard to hear. You could repeat. Hi, um, I am very starstruck right now, so also very nervous, but on the point of loneliness and millennials, um, one of the things that really struck me in the documentary was when you were talking about the feeling of being alone and how sort of terrifying that was. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or advice about finding independence and um, power and confidence in being alone um, to sort of prevent the negative feelings of loneliness. Yeah, if I understood correctly, because there is a point that I want to make that you remind me of. 
uh, for uh, all of you to know, I did a longitudinal study. I followed the children who were with me in the orphanage, what happened to them, all 50 of them. And it was very clear that the reason that none of them committed suicide, none of them uh, became drug addicts or alcohol, um, drug, any of the big mental health uh, issues that you people are dealing with in this conference. And that's because the early childhood, the early years of their childhood, the early socialization, in my case, 10 and a half years, in some other uh, children, maybe nine years, in some 11, a little bit older, were in a loving household with uh, relatives, like in my case, a grandmother who had nothing else to do but to take care of me. So that's very important for millennials and for other people who are now dealing with uh, young uh, children to know how that um, early years are the most the very crucial in terms of upbringing. And in terms of you have to take the courage to go out and use the uh, social media to find somebody, but you have to use, you have to use um, caution in order to find. Well, I was really struck in watching the film by the part where you are a single mother in New York and you're throwing parties every weekend and <laughs> your daughter's in the bedroom. I really loved, yeah, just the, the joie de vivre that was palpable in uh, what so, you brought to that life. And that, that has to do with my, uh, with my having been at home in a loving Jewish Orthodox uh, family and um, being very much cared for and being an only child. So I, I do uh, strongly believe that we have to talk more about that, about that early childhood. And do you have any advice for people who are trying to feel secure in being alone or people who want to feel independent and confident while they are perhaps not with a partner? No, I didn't get that. How to feel comfortable alone if you're not looking for a partner? How to feel comfortable if you're not? I don't want anybody not to look for a partner, period. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's get another question right over here. Hi there. What is one question, the one question you received the most over the course of your career, and how has your answer evolved over the decades? What's the question you've received most over your career, and how has your answer evolved over the decades? So um, the questions have changed, because in the previous years, uh, there were many more questions about men having ha uh, premature ejaculators, women not being able to have an orgasm. Those questions are here. Uh, they have changed. And what has not changed is uh, that it's difficult to find, uh, to find a significant other. So people have to work on that. Uh, but luckily, because of the social media, because of documentaries, because of many other uh, issues like that, that we, we in this country actually have the best uh, scientifically validated data about human sexual functioning that has ever been available from Masters and Johnson, from uh, um, Helen Singer Kaplan, who you really found that uh, clip, which is beautiful. Every time I watch that, I rejoice. Uh, so we have the best data, but we still need a lot of more research. We still need more research in order to find out how better to educate. I think we have time for one more question, probably. Who has something they'd like to ask? Let's go in, in the back there. So you are known for giving advice. And I'm curious uh, if you have, what, what's some of the best advice that you've ever received? Hmm. Some of the best advice that I ever received? Yeah, you're known for giving advice. What's I... the best advice you've ever taken? The best, uh, the best advice that I ever got is to be careful about Ryan's questions. <laughs> <laughs> and to watch him. No like, one gave her to that feed advice. Him, <laughs> to feed him. You gave yourself that advice. <laughs> to feed him all oh, the time. Works. <laughs> to make sure that he eats. 
and, uh, and uh, to, to, to make, to, just to be very careful about his very sneaky questions. <laughs> and, and there isn't one sentence in that film that I, I had nothing to do with the editing, but there's not one sentence in that film that I would have said, Ryan, don't put that in. Minus the four-letter word that you use in the end. That's better. I, I don't know why you did that. I usually don't say cow shit in my life. <laughs> <coughs> I threw a snowball at you, that's true. But why did you use that word cow shit? I don't know. You well, said you it. You said times. it. I did say it. There wasn't a word in here. That... It's a hot mic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that's probably a wrap for us. Cow <laughs> Or else to end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>